Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us uh, and joining us in person. How wonderful it is to see legs and shoes uh, uh, and everything else. So thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Naomi Miller. I'm Deputy Director of Bristol Ideas, and it's a real delight to welcome you to Watershed this morning. Uh, this event is part of our extended Festival of the Future City programme, and we are delighted to be partnering with Innovate UK, the UK's innovation uh, agency. Innovate UK works with people, companies and partner organisations to find and drive the science and technology innovations that will grow the UK economy. In this event today, we're going to be looking at the challenges in deploying innovative products that contribute to meeting local and national net zero ambitions and the ways in which we can bridge this innovation gap. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the format of the day and a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we've decided not to do a fire drill today, as fun as that would be. So if the fire alarm goes off, uh, it is a real one and there are uh, ushers and staff around who will direct you out. Um, we're going to run this event um, today without a break in the middle. So if you do at any point need to get up and use the facilities, please do feel free uh, to do that. We're going to have a number of presentations um, by individuals and then we will have a panel discussion at the end with audience Q&A. So please do think about your questions as we go through. We really want this to be a dialogue between uh, those on stage and those um, in the audience. So I'm going to give you a, um, some brief introductions to our speakers today and we'll do all of those now and then they'll come up uh, later on. So our first speaker this morning is Kevin O'Malley and Kevin is going to be setting the scene for us um, today. Kevin is an innovation lead in the urban systems team at Innovate UK. He also provides specialist help and support to local authorities in using the pre-commercial procurement instrument SBRI. Before joining Innovate UK, he was City Innovation Team Manager at Bristol City Council, leading the delivery of the award-winning Smart City programme, so it's lovely to have him back in Bristol today. Our next speaker will then be Emma Clement. Emma is the Senior Consultant at Urban Foresight with a background in tech technology innovation and strategy modelling. She joined Urban Foresight from the manufacturing industry where she worked with a range of companies on initiatives to enable performance growth, including developing strategy frameworks to prepare for Industry 4.0 and the Internet of Things. We're then going to be having a speaker joining us remotely, so let's all keep our fingers crossed uh, for the Wi-Fi. Um, Amrata Paptani is Product Manager at Homelink. Homelink leverages cutting-edge smart home integration and analytics technologies to address the needs of social landlords and their residents. In her role, Amrata explores how Homelink's Internet of Things solution can help in other areas such as hospitals and schools. After Amrata, we'll then have Adam Thorpe. Adam is Head of Policy and Programmes for the East of England Local Government Association. He has a wealth of experience in adult social care commissioning and transformation skills across, across three local authorities in the East of England and has skills in partnership development, service design and co-production. And really interesting to hear about that East-West comparison. After that, we, then, we will then have Kayser Williamson. Uh, Kayser is the head of place for Knowledge Transfer Network, leading on the development of this priority and delivering on KTN's commitment to connection, national and regional innovation to encourage distribution of economic and societal well-being across the UK. Finally, we will then have Natalie Ecosia and Matthew Davidson. Natalie is Industry Director of the Innovation Centre for Applied Sustainable Technologies and has a background in green chemistry, commercialisation and innovation, overseeing small to large scale scientific and economic operations in the public, private and commercial sectors. She is also a co-founder of Global Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in Technology Transfer. Matthew is her colleague and uh, director of the Centre of, Sus of Sustainable and Circular Technologies at the University of Bath and also executive director of ICAST and director of the EPSRC Centre for Doctoral Training in this area. Uh, he is a professor of sustainable chemical technologies and leads the catalysts uh, for the circular economy, economy strand of the UK Catalysts Hub. 
put my teeth in. Um, so we're going to have those presentations by, um, by all of our speakers. And then we're going to be joined by Stephen Hilton, who's going to be our chair for the panel discussion um, at the end. Stephen is the founder and director of City Global Futures and a smart cities expert. He has over 20 years experience of developing strategy and delivering projects with cities, government bodies, universities, businesses and communities. So as you can see, we've got a packed morning um, and I hope uh, everyone's excited for it. So we're going to start our presentations now. The presentations are then going to run through until 12 o'clock, just to give you an idea of timings. At that point, all of our speakers are going to come up onto the stage and we'll have this shared discussion. Um, as I say, we'd love to then hear your questions as part of that. We're going to do our summing up of the event um, at 12.30 with our closing remarks and we'll finish at quarter to one. Many of our speakers are staying around, so do please feel, uh, take, feel free to take the opportunity to talk to speakers us over coffee and things um, in the Watershed Cafe afterwards. Thank you very much for being here and if I could bring up to the stage uh, Kevin O'Malley. Thank you. Morning everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be back in Bristol and uh, have my suit on again. It feels like the last two years are just an awful nightmare. Um, so I'm Kevin O'Malley, I'm uh, an innovation leader at Innovate UK and uh, as was mentioned once of this parish, worked for the City Council in, in innovation. And um, I'll just tell you a little bit about Innovate UK and why it is we're interested in this area. So Innovate UK supports businesses and it tries to drive the creation of high quality sustainable jobs and growth in the UK economy through supporting innovation. But also we have a, a mission which is around uh, utilising the innovation cap capability in the UK to tackle major challenges. And certainly one of the most major challenges we have today is achieving net zero. And what you have there is a map of all of the local authorities in the UK who have declared a climate emergency. Um, and that, that's, that, that's really significant and really important because it was recognised in the sixth uh, carbon budget that local authorities can deliver approximately 30% of the savings that are required to reach net zero. So there's a, there's a really significant contribution that can be made there. Um, but I, I suppose the ambition and the, um, the, the political support that's... Uh, that's demonstrated through declaring a climate emergency needs then to be followed up with some sort of delivery or operational capacity and that's really I suppose what we're here to discuss and unpack today. Um, there's, there's, there's quite an unequal landscape I suppose about what people are able to achieve and, um, and what it is that they're aiming to achieve in net zero. And that creates something of a gap and in thinking about what I mean by bridging the gap, there's a number of different areas that I think we could sort of begin to discuss or, uh, or, or consider. The first is this idea of we have this terrific um, strategic ambition, which is represented through all of those declarations of climate emergency. Um, but do we have a delivery capacity at an operational level to be able to follow through on that. I mean, there are, there are 16 local authorities who said that they will be carbon neutral by 2025, which is extraordinary. Uh, so we have to examine that. And in order to achieve uh, carbon neutrality, it's not about doing the things that we're doing more efficiently. It's about a complete shift, a complete disruption, a total step change. So innovation is going to be fundamental to getting to where we need to be. And if we haven't got an innovation ca uh, capacity, capability within local authorities, we're not going to get to where we need to be. And there's something around responsibility and risk. Innovation brings risk. It's doing new things, working in new ways. And local authorities have responsibility in many ways for, uh, well, they've got fiscal responsibility, got responsibility for uh, looking after our democracy. So there's a real balance there between how much risk public authorities can take in this space and are prepared to take and are familiar with taking in this space. 
And also there's a, there's a mit- mismatch, a gap between a business's understanding of what key challenges are for local authorities and also I would feel local authorities' understanding of what the state of current innovation is and what the capability of the most innovative technologies are. Uh, when I worked in the city council, I didn't know that many people who understood graphene or big data or, or many of these you know, really interesting technologies and powerful technologies. Um, I also think there's, some sort of, there's a gap that might need to be bridged between and within councils. Um, I, 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 this, this is just my take and my understanding of this, but I feel as if councils don't always play particularly well together. There's almost a competitive uh, nature between local authorities. And if there were ways in which they could collaborate more effectively, could uh, share intelligence, could um, uh, uh, collectively procure solutions, uh, maybe there's real advantages in that. But also within councils, different departments tend to sit within their silos and don't necessarily always... um, work well together and in order to solve this net zero challenge to deliver on this ambition um, all departments are going to have to work collectively in a very systemic way so that is going to require some sort of bridging of a gap Um, I also think there's something around the sort of cultures of of private and public sector organisations I don't know whether people who work in public sector organisations are suspicious of the motivations of people who work uh, in commercial organisations and have a profit motive and maybe people who work in business uh, suspect that people who work in the public sector aren't particularly efficient, they're too bureaucratic they work too slowly, maybe that, that creates a mismatch and uh, an issue of trust around there that if we could bridge that gap, if we could understand those contexts better then perhaps we can move uh, more effectively um, I think there's a real opportunity of bridging the gap between research and industry. We have excellent fundamental research in the UK that if we can translate that into, in, into industry and then into commercialised products, we can really um, we can really advance the opportunity of delivering um, net zero. And finally, I think winners and losers, with any disruption, with any uh, significant change, there are people who will necessarily lose out. And I think we need to make sure that that gap is understood between winners and losers and is managed so that we have a just transition toward net zero and that we minimise the people who are the losers and uh, we ensure that we're not creating losers who are already disadvantaged in this area. So that's just my thoughts and ideas. And we're going to hear some amazing speakers today. And I'm really looking forward to hear what the audience has to say Uh, later on. So, thanks very much. (laughs) So I just press the button. Great, it's been a while. (laughs) Hello everybody, and thank you Kevin for introducing the session and helping to set the scene. Um, I'm going to go into it all in a little bit more detail now. Um, Here to talk to you about a research project that we completed for Innovate UK last year on bridging the innovation gap. And I really hope that this will be a good starting point for hearing more about the insights of the other speakers. In a second, um, when I say we, First of all, hi, I'm Emma, (laughs) and uh, I come from an organisation called Urban Foresight. We started over 10 years ago as a smart cities consultancy, and we now work in all sorts of different aspects of helping places to bring technology and innovations to solve the challenges that they're experiencing in delivering services, thinking about the future, and so on. Which is to say, uh, we've got plenty of experience from both sides of this problem. We sell to councils. We sell to local authorities and other governing authorities and we are embedded within them, helping them to solve their challenges. So when it came to doing this research project for Innovate UK, we absolutely jumped at the chance. We know what this is. (laughs) We know this problem. 
So today I'm going to take you quickly through um, the project which was split into three phases. Firstly, we built off of Innovate UK's suspicions about the innovation gap to define it a bit more precisely. Then we looked at ways that we could respond to it and made some wider recommendations about acting on those responses. So the project, um, our research looked at defining and analysing the problems faced by this suspected innovation gap between companies and local authorities, <coughs> where local authorities are aiming to get to net zero by 2050, though many of them have other um, differently defined targets. We were quite tight in our scope in that we were looking at sort of innovative products and solutions selling to local authorities, though I think the learnings can be translated across to other areas. Um, in doing so, in January and April last year, we started off by validating our understanding by interviewing councils, interviewing companies, a wide range of sizes and people at different steps along their journey. And we conducted a supplier questionnaire with different innovative companies. Um, so this meant that the project is really rooted in strong sort of first person evidence about what the innovation gap is and how it's been experienced by both sides. We then disaggregated net zero as a concept into an action framework. So we broke down the big complex challenge of net zero into discrete challenges. And uh, this gave, gives you more of a framework to work off when you're thinking about net zero. And consequently, we then mapped private activity against this framework. So we looked at the state of private sector supply against these actions in the framework, and we were able to sort them out in a more structured manner which helped us to identify conclusions and sort of formulate our insight and key points from all this research. So we supplied Innovate UK with a series of reports, one of which the summary report is available online. Um, I tested it out. If you Google urban foresight bridging the innovation gap, the PDF does come up, but my algorithm might be a bit biased. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but if you have any problems, just let me know. So defining the causes of the innovation gap. Quite straightforwardly, we found that the innovation gap is a set of frustrations, communications and disconnects, which I think Kevin did give quite a good insight into there, um, between local authorities and private sector suppliers who want to supply to them. And we concluded that it's causes more about culture than technology because companies often find it difficult to sell innovative ideas to local government, whilst places often find companies unnerving to deal with or hard to fit into their existing processes for a variety of reasons. And these gaps prevent innovation and create barriers to net zero ambitions. To summarise the causes we identified on the city side, um, I actually changed that word to council. This is a different version of my presentation because it's not just cities. We talk to places of all different sizes. Um, but ultimately, on the place side, all of the causes of the innovation gap relate to organisational culture in local government. So when it comes to capacity, obviously, I'm sure many of you are aware, there's limitations on resources in terms of headcount, in terms of the amount of resources available, and in terms of headspace, so the bandwidth available to them. And often... Um, we found there was quite a lot of reticence for this reason to new forms of funding that could help support innovation because they didn't want to take on new forms of administration that go alongside with them. Um, secondly, their understanding of net zero. Technical definition of net zero are very clear ordinarily, but in practice they can be applied very differently. Um, informally, usage varies, for example, not including offsetting or including offsetting or defining the scope of net zero as the council as a working organisation or the council as the local area that it serves. Um, we found that environment, transport and energy and to some extent waste specialists tend to be very strict with their definitions, but the challenges were with a sort of wider institutional understanding of what net zero means and what net zero means to that council in particular. In terms of procurement, kept on coming back to this, often innovative solutions don't easily fit into existing categories for procurement or existing processes for procurement. Um, so in terms of categories, tenders could be too vague, they could be too specific. In terms of processes, the scoring criteria was often um, not conducive to procuring innovative solutions and net zero is not a specified award criteria and um, often things involving a proven um, performance history favour companies with established records rather than new companies who are offering something a bit different. Budgets. Um, 
Net zero solutions tend to offer benefits across different parts of a local authority, whereas budgets are still bounded by department by department. So the benefits of, of often sort of not um, accounted for as an aggregate and can't be justified against the budget spend. Um, also in net zero, frustratingly, many suppliers offer benefits over longer timescales than councils are budgeting for when they're looking for those solutions. I think the worst example of this that I found in the interviews um, was talking to a council who had had a pot of funding and wanted to install triple glazing, but the cost benefit would have been for quite a long period. Um, so they installed double glazing instead because the cost benefit was a shorter period. So it's a bit disappointing. Um, in terms of structures, this is quite a key one, in my opinion. Um, companies reported having impenetrable local government structures. So even when companies could develop a relationship with somebody within council and identify a relevant contact, the chances of them finding that that person was informed, influential and interested all at the same time was really challenging. And new forms of governance don't help this um, because the likes of um, city deals, towns fund, things that are coming out now. Um, when, like I said before, the administered version of new funds mean that when they're introduced, often councils reach immediately for people who are closest to them and who they have informal relationships with. Um, so that's the challenge seen there. But it's not just the council's fault. There are problems on the supplier side as well, um, all of which we found relate to poor awareness of the council as customers and what it means to sell to councils. So, for example, lack of awareness of net zero concepts. Often companies do not pitch their efforts in terms of the language and um, criteria that councils are using for net zero. Influence of ownership and company structure, so particularly in very small companies or startups, they have a cash runway and they need really quick results, whereas councils work to slower and politically led timescales. So many small businesses are very debt averse, they're very cash poor. Any delays, cancellations or changes in contracts can hit them really hard. Um, we've personally experienced this where we're excited to get going with a contract that we've been appointed to at a council and um, we want to start promoting it so we can organise workshops, but there's a local election and they can't um, do any sort of promotional things at, at that time and that's hit our contract and that's hit our delivery timescale. Um, and this can lead to a lot of frustration, a lot of anger and impatience and a lack of understanding from companies um, and councils. And we talked to some small businesses who have ultimately written off the public sector as a potential market and a potential client because they just find them so difficult to deal with and um, so difficult to understand because they don't quite have that same um, yeah, structure and understanding. Um, similarly, on business models, so there's a lot of new and innovative business models happening out there. For example, um, dynamic models where the companies take a cut of the savings made by a solution. Um, and these don't fit in with council budgeting requirements, despite being very low risk and despite being designed by some very well-meaning people who want to offer a low risk and high reward solution. Um, and, you know, when a council needs to see um, their capital, their revenue and businesses are offering software as a service or dynamic pricing, it gets a bit too confusing and it can not end well. Um, language, uh, companies love their buzzwords, <laughs> big data, data flywheel, machine learning. These are great, but they can be confusing for public sector and um, for people who are working you know, day to day on one operation. Um, it can create distrust for non-specialists within councils. Um, also, I think key, a key takeaway under this was that disruption is seen as unambiguously good at the minute in sort of small business and um, startup environments, whereas in councils, it's unambiguously bad to introduce disruption to their processes, <coughs> particularly if their processes are ones that involve statutory requirements where they could be penalised if they're disrupted too significantly, um, whereas businesses still think Surely councils would be up for my disruptive solution. On skills, um, this is my key takeaway actually from my interviews, is that business of businesses concentrate their skills on time and investment in their core product teams and coming up with these excellent ideas for business models and things like this. But they don't invest in understanding how to sell to places, which for everyone here 
you have come here to understand how to sell to places, so that's fine, but <laughs> quite a few businesses don't. Um, whereas when we talk to larger firms, they almost always explicitly invest in an individual who's out there networking in councils. He's like a figurehead who's got a very, very good LinkedIn. People like that who are out there helping to understand the narrative, understand the dynamic of different councils and learn about their operating models. So smaller firms either lack the resources to do this, the inclination to do this, or the understanding that this is how you sell to councils. Great. Um, so this is a little summary just to clarify that this is a very balanced gap and the problems lie on both sides. So what can we do about it? Our research um, output two tools for enabling solutions to the innovation gap. Um, both were designed to help Innovate UK and others in developing projects to support resolving these problems. So first of all, a framework for net zero actions by places. So I described this earlier on. Um, we break down the big, difficult challenge of net zero all the way through to tactical solutions. So the high level or strategic challenge is the big thematic question. Um, so this is suited to working on prioritizing different actions or understanding if you're balancing your focus in the right area. The tactical challenge is more of a, a problem um, suited to a challenge-based approach to procurement or innovation calls to the private sector. So using the language that we've used in tactical challenges, you could put out a procurement call and hopefully it will be tightly defined enough to generate meaningful responses, but not so specific that new forms of solution might be missed. And finally, the tactical solutions uh, ones that we've seen in the market as having sort of emerging or established suppliers. So this means that it could be um, taken on as a focused, discrete project working within familiar supplier markets, concepts and language, and counts can, in theory, sort of test their feet with innovative solutions. Um, here's an example, and I know the resolution's not very good, um, of the framework segment. If you go online and find the report, the resolution's excellent. Um, this is the high level challenge of reducing direct emissions from sources within your place and you can see how reducing emissions from buildings um, gets disaggregated all the way down um, to, for example, green roofings and walls is on there for housing stock. Um, the colour coding on each of the solutions I'll go on to in a second, but that relates to the market readiness of the solution. And if you want to have a go looking at this framework we did build an online tool um, to explore it so let me know if you take a look at that and you find any interesting uses for it because we're interested in seeing if it's useful for people so the second s set of tools we came up with and um, that complements this framework of actions is a set of tools that map the market of available solutions against it one of these tools is a framework for defining the impact maturity of market solutions. Um, to create this, we analysed those tactical solutions against the relative maturity of supply in the sort of private sector market and the relevance or impact of that solution to net zero. And this meant that they all fell out of having one of these four categories. Um, this example chart shows the main groups of solutions from areas of particular interest mapped against their relevance and maturity and color coded by their sort of area of focus. And the output of this, the, the idea behind it, was that we could give Innovate UK ideas as to what actions they can take for each of these solutions um, to help build the market within them and develop more solutions for councils to look at. And a lot of these actions, sorry, I should say, uh, based on existing programmes, I mean, I can imagine sort of KTNs and things using them. So. And um, finally, this is supported by a database of the different um, businesses that we identified in the UK. So finally, onto the final section, uh, recommendations for councils, companies and Innovate UK. So these recommendations are pretty high level. Um, and if you go into the report, you'll see that we build them out in more detail. But I think this gives you an idea that it's a problem for everybody to be working on. And all's not lost. It is possible. So for places, city councils, local authorities, combined authorities, we really recommend just investing in the idea of net zero and how you're procuring, 
procuring solutions um, for it. So you should look at the resources and capabilities available to you, map them out, have an idea, perhaps do a gap analysis as to what you're not using. There are procurement approaches out there that other councils are using, for example. Why aren't you using them in your council? Can you um, introduce them to your area? Um, there are lots of people within councils, and we talk to plenty of them, who are informed and who are interested but don't have the influential channels that they need. So put funding, put people and put political backing in the same place and create those channels for people to have conversations about what solutions they'd like to introduce in the area. Um, Within the council, broaden the skill sets and create new ways of working to help build momentum behind innovative ideas. And uh, take leadership. We saw councils at all sorts of different stages along their net zero journey. And those that had taken leadership on defining what it is early on, going out there and talking to other councils, um, were really helping everyone. So it, and they're really helping themselves to move along on this agenda in a sustainable um, way. For suppliers, I think all of this circles back to the de defining the problem. Um, speak the language of councils, understand the pressures that if local authorities are facing in terms of their capacity, their statutory requirements and things, and invest early in networking and tendering. So again, invest in understanding the market. And finally, for places like Innovate UK and other government bodies, um, build capacity in local government by funding it. Have a think about net zero and try and standardise it to make it easier for both councils and companies to you know, work from the same footing. Um, on that note, commodification of carbon, um, people trip up quite a lot on actually how to um, you know, deal with it and trade it. Um, so look at larger sort of carbon embedded approaches so that we are actually getting sustainable solutions out of this. Um, and ultimately, that's, that's it. So thank you very much. Um, that's my email. Please tell me if you use the framework. <laughs> so, thanks very much. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, that was a lovely presentation just now. Um, and it's, it's a great day to be dialing in. Uh, so, my name is Amrita Poptani. I'm going to jump right in um, after my peer. So, uh, I'll basically be sharing the point of view from a, uh, from a technology provider's side uh, when working with local authorities in achieving, you know, the UK's net zero goals. Uh, so, before I get into that, a little about me, I'm a product manager from Homelink. Uh, Homelink is an IoT startup that was acquired by ACO, a market-leading fire alarm company with about 30 years of experience in that sector. So um, together, ACO and Homelink have built an IoT open ecosystem with environmental sensors and alarms that connect to powerful analytics platforms for social landlords and social residents. So we've been working together with housing associations across the UK uh, and local authorities to create better maintained, healthier, safer, and more energy efficient social homes using the um, using the, uh, the IoT sensors and alarms and our intelligent predictive machine learning algorithms. Now, I've used um, a bunch of uh, tech buzzwords here. We've got IoT open ecosystem, analytics platforms, predictive machine learning algorithms. And a few years ago, this would have been enough to turn the innovation gap into a chasm, right? But uh, today it's slightly different slightly more positive in that there is this inherent curiosity and a desire to use innovation for our betterment. Uh, but this doesn't mean that there aren't obstacles. There is an innovation gap, um, as, as my peers pointed out. Um, and this gap is made from frustrations, communication errors, and disconnects between technology providers and local authorities. So within the housing industry, this gap could be the difference between reaching our climate goals and just giving up and living in the metaverse forever. And don't get me wrong, I love the metaverse, but reality has its charms, as I'm sure you'll agree. But I'm going off point, so let's rewind a little for some context. Um, what has housing got to do with net zero? Well, local authorities um, have Recently, local authorities everywhere have declared a climate emergency. 
Um, the latest figures for greenhouse gas emissions in the UK show a release of about 326 million tonnes of CO2 per year. There are 27 million domestic buildings in the UK, and this make up uh, 25 to 30 percent of the 300 million, 300 over million tons of CO2. Meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement um, will require buildings across the globe to improve energy intensity by 30 to 50 percent per square meter. And to top that, the energy sector is responsible for three quarters of global carbon emissions. Because of this, Many of our local legislations have put massive focus on how energy efficiency will power our net zero climate goals. To achieve a target of net zero, a large reduction in energy use is needed within the housing market. And to meet this, it is, as it is estimated that we will need to comprehensively retrofit about 500,000 homes per year. And um, which, and that's basically most of the UK's existing housing stock. And this is where a local standard, um, some of you may be familiar with it, past 2035 comes into play. So previous attempts to deliver retrofit measures were seen as a failure, as no universal standard or approach had been agreed upon, and several high profile failures compounded the issue. And it wasn't just the innovation gap that produced the obstacles here. There was barely any space for technology or innovation to even tiptoe in and make a difference. So what we needed was the establishment of an industry-wide code of practice, which resulted in the publication of PAST 2035. Um, and this, this document, the PAST 2035, uh, provided a step-by-step step step framework for retrofitting. So past 2035 was then followed by many other local funds, strategies and legislations. For example, the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, Energy Company Obligation, the Scotland Heat in Building Strategy, the NF Energy Efficient Standard for Social Housing, the Wales Optimised Retrofit Programme, Enerfit, Super Home Standard and so many more. And here's the beautiful bit. In 2006, the CEO of Nesta, the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts, Jonathan Kastenbaum, put out a report calling the government out on the fact that innovation is vital in all sectors of the UK economy. And yet, it was not being given room within policies. But today, with past 2035 and all the other legislations, funds and government strategies that I just mentioned, innovation is at the heart of success. There is an innovation gap, but it's been made smaller. There is a space carved out in, in our local legislations today for technology. Uh, because of this, local authorities and businesses such as ourselves can work together to use innovation to support net zero initiatives. For example, we at Homelink can work together with social landlords. And let's use PAS 2035 as an example. This framework has six steps for retrofitting and steps three and step six involve pre-retrofit and post-retrofit monitoring and evaluation. So this can easily be done with our IoT sensors that monitor everything from thermal efficiency and indoor air quality to predicting the risk of mold or dangerously low oxygen levels. Um, our innovative technology helps the housing industry stay compliant with PAS 2035, inadvertently helping local authorities like social landlords reach their net zero goals. But the story doesn't end there. In every fairy tale and fable, our hero goes through multiple setbacks. Every win is followed by an all new challenge. And this time, it is the innovation gap. Legislations have caught up, but there is still a disconnect. And I'll give another real world example, another challenge that we've faced. Um, my team and I are, have been working on a new way for landlords to share monthly bytes of information with their upper management. For example, let's say 100 homes have been retrofitted and they need to monitor these homes for a couple of months after, they'll have to send this information or present this information to their upper management. So we had assumed that to share um, such monthly progress reports, the landlords had some form of a template um, for this monthly report. And when interviewing with a social landlord for insight, we found that 
every month they would simply have a meeting and present their information on an Excel sheet, not even PowerPoint, which they quoted as being too sophisticated for us. The beginnings of this conversation highlight the innovation gap. Um, not only was there a disconnect, but there was already this apprehension the moment the conversation started. What we were proposing wasn't miles ahead of what they were used to, it was hundreds of miles ahead. So naturally, they started asking questions like, why should we change? Should we change at all? Would it make a difference? What we have works. Why change something that's not broken? It feels easier to stick with what we've got. Why rock the boat? Suffice it, suffice it to say, there is a mindset that needs to change. And we can't smash a new solution like a plate of cake on their face. Um, as my peer before me said, this is something that we need to we need to speak their language. We need to walk with them. So as a technology provider, we have the responsibility of walking them through this journey and taking each step as we go along um, with the change. So by the end of the conversation with this social landlord, uh, we had the landlord saying that they'd be happy to have a look at an example of what we could come up with, something that will not only simplify their jobs, but standardize it from month to month. Already, we could see the sparkle in his eyes. So we've had quite a few jarring experiences like this one. And sometimes they don't end on a positive note, like the example I've just given. So we have had landlords who were so keen to adopt our solution until they realized that adopting our smart monitoring solution would probably highlight homes that had issues. Who would have thought a company with IoT sensors to monitor homes would actually highlight problems within a home? Um, but another obstacle that adds to the innovation gap here is people chasing the hype of technology instead of the opportunity costs in the long term. So here it's a mixture of miscommunication and a disconnect with what our innovation can deliver at the end of the day and how it can actually help in the long term. In another example, uh, again, something uh, that was previously touched on in the presentation for mine uh, about investing in and creating new ways of working with new technology. So we have landlords who struggle on how to fit this technology after adopting it. They struggle on how to actually use it and incorporate it into their daily, everyday responsibilities. Um, and then we have landlords who invest early on in creating a whole new team of people who will be responsible over this side of things. And we can clearly see here the different levels of commitment to adopting innovative technology, and it makes all the difference. So basically, if I were to turn this into a, a simple analogy, and if you had to take away one thing from my ramblings today, it's this. We are on the right part, path. Um, our feet are taking us in the right direction, but it almost feels as if our heads are turned backwards, um, as if we're not yet ready to take that final leap to just run, run straight ahead. There is a space for it. There is curiosity. And from a tech, a tech provider's point of view, acceptance and action are where we're stumbling over right now. And, and so that I'll say, um, you know, it's, it's time to look forwards and many, many local authorities are taking this, you know, they're taking it um, excitedly and, and they're looking forwards and they're ready to give change a chance. So it's time for all of us to kind of just start moving with it. Um, we'll stumble along the way, but we've got a whole lot of innovative ways to keep us on track now. So yeah. Um, that's me on my end. Uh, it was really good dialing in. I will uh, let our next speaker join us and I will see you guys for the panel discussion. <laughs> Hello everyone, great to see you today. Uh, my name's Adam. Um, I'm representing the East of England Local Government Association today. Um, I hope some of the things that I say today will be interesting for you. It's actually my first time in Bristol ever, so it's been great to visit the city very briefly. Um, but since being here, I've had the 
best pizza I've ever had in my life. So it's been, a, it's been a great visit for me, and I hope some of what I say today will be interesting for you. I'm going to try and not be too doom and gloom. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the barriers that exist within local authorities um, in terms of embracing innovation and probably build on some of the points that Kevin and Emma have already made, but also touch upon some, what some of the solutions might be. So in terms of East of England Local Government Association, what we do is broadly we're the membership body of all of the 50 councils in the East of England and we're very fortunate that all of the councils in our patch are members of our organisation. And we're all about bringing those councils together to collaborate, share best practice um, and support them to lobby government with a single unified voice for the greater support they might need. So Kevin talked a little bit about the kind of competition that exists sometimes between councils um, and I think that that's true to a certain extent but hopefully part of what we do is bring councils together to collaborate and and not kind of work in competition against each other. Um, more specifically on climate change clearly you know it's a, it's a massive challenge for all organizations all individuals and I think for councils um, to a certain extent they've kind of been struggling with understanding what their role is in meeting net zero targets. I think they can be quite clear about what their individual organisation's impact, impacts are and what they can do to start reducing those. But what is their role in kind of the broader societal issues uh, that we need to change to achieve net zero targets? And something we've done in the east of England is bring together a regional climate change forum of councils. And that's represented by the kind of county-based uh, climate change partnerships and commissions each lead politician and lead officer for those groups comes together for the big regional forum to look at what we can do to share best practice, working, um, working collaboratively, collaboratively together and not in competition, and also what do we need to be asking government for. So I'm sure you're all aware government released its net zero strategy, um, but in there there wasn't a lot about what councils need to be doing. There was mention of a local net zero forum um, as a way of discussing these issues between central government and local government and hopefully that will kind of help councils understand what their more specific roles are in achieving net zero. Specifically for our region, um, those of you that might be aware of the east of England have ever been there, it's quite a rural region um, and that does pose its own issues. You know, it means there's very high car ownership, lots of, people's having to, lots of people having to kind of drive in from them, villages into the market towns and don't really have the option of public transport. Um, to get, get about and, and do what they need to do. But also our region is the UK's international gateway. You know, we have a huge concentration of seaports and airports and huge amounts of goods coming into our region for the rest of the country and coming in, and leaving our region um, into the continent from the rest of the UK. So that means r really high concentration of heavy goods movements and lots of lorries trundling around our roads carrying massive containers. And what can we do about that to, to get those off the roads? We're working on a pilot project this year uh, with Innovate UK and Innovate UK KTN to look at how we can start bringing local authorities together with businesses to start exploring some of the innovative solutions those businesses have um, in helping councils meet their net zero targets. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about that project because our colleague Kezia is going to talk to you more about that. But I think that's going to help us start to bridge some of the, this innovation gap between councils and local authorities. OK, I said I wasn't going to be too doom and gloom, but on to the barriers. So this has already been mentioned, but funding. Um, it has to be at the top of the list, and it really is a massive issue for councils. Um, as you probably know, kind of decade, decade or more of austerity, councils have really struggled with their finances. We're really in a position where councils are spending their money on the things that have to be delivered and are crucial. Therefore, looking at, that money, looking at that funding and looking at how it could be spent differently to embrace innovation can be really tough for councils because they have to think about what can we drop to try something new in a lot of cases. And in most cases, they can't drop any of it. So, you know, how can we really explore innovation in a situation like that? Capacity. That, this has already been mentioned, but it links to the funding. You know, the vast majority of council's funding goes on its people and its people delivering services. And those people are so overstretched because their teams aren't big enough and they're so focused on the day job. It's really hard for those people to lift their heads above the parapet and think about a slightly different way of doing things. Risk aversity. So I think historically 
councils have been fairly risk averse as organisations. I don't think that's as true today as it once was. Um, but it's kind of symptomatic of a few things, really. One of those being that some of the services and support councils offer are, are crucial to some of the most vulnerable people in society. Therefore, when you're supporting people who are in real dire need for that support, um, it can be seen as quite risky to, to think about a slightly different way of doing things, which potentially you know, might have, have a negative impact on those people or m might not be as positive as, as what they were doing before. So you know, people can quite, hold quite a high level of risk when delivering those sorts of um, services to people that really need it. The use of taxpayers' money. I think um, you know, people, are, the general public, are quite keen to find out how their money is being spent. Therefore, sometimes people in councils can have a perception that it wouldn't um, kind of be perceived that positively if some of that taxpayers' money was being used to try some what be, might be perceived as quite wacky new ideas. And public perception. So this probably touches more on the point of the politics and, and what the politicians would like to see. But um, uh, and it goes alongside the kind of the the idea of taxpayers' money. But politicians might feel that if this new idea that they were to embrace and put lots of funding towards all blew up and went wrong, what's the kind of public perception? What's the negative media um, attention going to look like coming out of that? Okay, better hold back and not do it. So that that can be a, a big barrier at times. And then in terms of governance, I think dis decision making can be a bit slower at times in councils. Um, we're political organisations, and you know we need to be accountable for the public money we spend, and that's a great thing. But because of the politics and because of the different structures in place within councils, it can take quite a long time to make a decision. So. You know, I've taken all sorts of reports to committees of politicians in different councils that I've worked in, and some of them have been kind of eight-week lead-in time. So you do an early draft of this thing eight weeks before the actual meeting which, where the thing is going to be decided. By the time you've got to the point of the meeting where it's going to be decided, it's all kind of changed anyway. And, um, and what we might have been able to do eight weeks ago, you know, th there's no longer time for because we've had to wait all of this time for the actual decision to be made. That can be an issue at times. Procurement regulations, we've already talked about procurement already. I'm not going to go into huge amounts of kind of boring <laughs> detail about procurement, but that can be a bit of a barrier for local authorities and innovation. And it's not always the procurement regulations themselves. Sometimes it's the um, misunderstanding of them and some council officers and politicians being risk averse towards trying innovation because they think procurement will say, no, you can't do things like this. But sometimes there are real regulations in place which mean that councils quite rightly have to be really careful with how they spend their money. But it um, means that they, they struggle to kind of go to sorts of suppliers they might not have used before, smaller suppliers with um, technology or services that haven't been tested as much as other organisations. And then culture. I think there, there's a few things to mention on culture. There's, um, there's, a, there's an idea of uh, things being done the way they've been done for a very long time, and therefore the, the, the analogy of trying to shift the tanker. There's also the, the culture of a slight mistrust um, of what businesses' motivations are. But I think there's also the kind of internal culture within councils. When transformation um, has tried to be achieved, so I, for a couple of years, worked in a transformation team at Cambridgeshire County Council. And it was a real kind of eye-opener for me because it was the first time I tried to achieve innovation and transformation within a council. And there was real political appetite, real kind of senior officer appetite to, um, to actually achieve transformation and innovation within the council. But we struggled at times because we kind of went out to these service delivery teams with all these crazy new ideas about different ways which, in which we could be doing things. And there was a bit of um, kind of distrust between those colleagues and us and, you know, the idea of who are these guys kind of coming in and trying to tell us what we should be doing. We've been doing this stuff for ages. We know what works. Um, so, you know, it's a bit about getting the kind of the actual people delivering the services involved in that innovation. But as I said, the capacity, you know, they're short staffed. They're on the ground working as hard as they can. So for them to kind of lift their head above the parapet and try and think about innovation can be hard. Um, but when you've got disconnected silos within the organization trying to achieve things, 
can be really, really difficult. In terms of um, doing things the way they've been done for a long time, I think that certainly was true in the past, but this kind of idea of a council job being a job for life isn't really as true anymore. You know, there's a much higher rate of staff turnover within our councils. And I think that, um, you know, clearly that, that, that's a bad thing for, for some people that haven't been able to keep their jobs. But new kind of members of, uh, new colleagues coming into councils with new ideas and a higher turnover does mean that it is more possible um, kind of in today's climate to embrace innovation and do things slightly differently in councils. And then the idea of the potentially councils being a little bit anti-business um, I think that certainly was true in the past, and I think, uh, you know, in its most fundamental sense, the idea is businesses are there to make profit and councils are there to help people, and trying to kind of bring those two groups together and, and um, work together can be difficult. But due to, um, due to the funding situations for councils, they themselves have had to become much more business-like over the last few years. They've really had to themselves look at how they can generate their own income and not rely on central government funding. And I think as a result of councils becoming more business-like themselves, they understand business better and therefore they um, will trust external private sector businesses more than they would have in the past. OK, so a little bit about solutions. And unfortunately, I haven't got all the answers today for bridging the gap. but. Um, just like to kind of suggest a couple of solutions to bear in mind. So in terms of funding, broadly, we need more funding, yeah, um, but it's not going to happen. There's no magic money tree as much as we'd all love there to be. So there needs to be more innovative um, op options for funding. So um, opportunities like social impact bonds, you know, could we um, explore those more? And more flexible procurement regulations would um, allow councils to embrace innovation better. Greater collaboration, I think, between councils, between councils and businesses to start thinking about how they can innovate and work together um, will really help us to bridge this gap. And I'm hopeful that the project that we have running this year in our region to collaborate business with businesses and councils will start helping us locally to bridge the gap. And we can take that learning across the whole of the UK. And then devolution. So greater devolution from central government. Fairly topical given this week we had the publication of the levelling up white paper that talks about how local areas are going to be supported to increase their own powers and spending. I think it kind of, um, you know, wait, we need to wait to see what that will look like um, in, the, in the devil of the detail. But I do believe that greater devolution from central government um, approaches towards allocating funding and al allocating powers to local areas where they better understand their residents and communities and the business community can support to bridge the innovation gap um, between local authorities and businesses. So that's a, a few thoughts from me in terms of the barriers and some potential solutions. And I look forward to uh, answering any questions you may, may have at the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Oh, I'm just going to just, if you'll indulge me, just have a little moment where I can enjoy seeing all of your faces in a, in a line rather than in little tiles on a screen. It's so lovely. OK, OK, thank you. Just, just going to absorb that. It's been a couple of years. So, um, um, yeah, I'm delighted to be here in person with all of you today. And as per the introduction, my name is Kezia Williamson. I'm head of place for Innovate UK KTN. And as the name suggests, we're a partner organisation of Innovate UK, and we've already heard from, from Kevin and what, what that means. Our side of things is that we do the connectivity piece. So the N used to, well, the, K, the N in KTN stands for network, and that's the bit that we, that we do a lot of. So our purpose is to bring people together to solve these big challenges, to create positive change in the world, that might be economic, that might be environmental, it might be societal. But we believe that by bringing people together, whether that's creating something completely brand new, completely disruptive in a sector, or taking something that actually works really well over here and giving it a new purpose and a new application somewhere else is, is the way that we can solve these, these challenges. 
At Innovate UK KTM, we do this by building communities and having deep expertise across key sectors and industries that are important for the UK. So that can be anything from health to transport, space to immersive technologies, design to manufacturing, covering all of these different topic areas and then seeing how we can bring these connections and make think that these things happen. My role then looking from a place perspective is to, to translate between what's happening in our sectors and industries and then what that means for our places across the country. That means support what we might do within a place to support a local innovation ecosystem. So that might mean understanding the certain clusters and what we might do to support those clusters. And it might also mean looking at, at other drivers like access to investment, for example, which we know is can be a bit patchy across the country depending on where you are. Importantly, as a national organisation, a big focus for us is how can we bring different places together to collaborate and to share experiences so that we can solve some of these bigger, really tricky challenges. It doesn't get much trickier than net zero. And, and so how can we bring pit places together to, to share these learnings? There's a lot of commonality in the challenges that we're all facing around net zero. So how can we work together to try and solve those challenges? So what are we doing about it? Well, guess what? We're building a community. We're building a community in this case that's really focused around local regional authorities. And we're bringing that community together, understanding what those challenges are, and then connecting them to our big network of solution providers. And what's interesting about this, to, to the point that Adam was making about there's different levels of capacity and resource, and Emma's point earlier about the different levels of understanding, it's actually by bringing all of these different people together, we can start to even out some of that understanding. So actually someone over here has got a dedicated person that really understands about net zero transport. Well, how can we share all the things they know with this authority over here that doesn't have any of that resource? So there's, there's lots of um, hopeful bridging of gaps that is going on within this project. And then we're also working with other stakeholders in the ecosystem, for example, the energy hubs and, and some of the catapults to, to make sure we're, we're bringing as much of this story together as possible. And in doing so, what we've identified is that there are three broad themes that we, that we keep coming up um, with. Um, so it's decarbonisation of buildings, decarbonisation of transport and energy systems. And fortunately, I have some wonderful colleagues who happen to be experts in those areas and have really great networks of businesses that, that have solutions in those areas. So Mike's leading on the buildings work, Louise on energy systems and Simon on transport. The whole project's being led by my colleague Nilam, and she's also our resident procurement expert. And the procurement side of things has already been touched on quite a lot today, which is fantastic to see, because that's something that's really coming out to us so strongly. So we're working with Crown Commercial Services and other procurement bodies to bring that piece of the puzzle along on this journey too. So as we are doing this connection piece, that we're, we're working alongside procurement. Our mechanism that we are using for this connection piece is our Innovation Exchange, which is our open innovation platform. And through this, we're able to bring together the challenges with the solutions. So we, we work with our um, community to identify those challenges. We refine those down until we're happy that we've got a challenge that we think that there are solutions for and then we publish that out through our to our network and we really push it out far and wide i mentioned that we're all about sort of unusual connections and bringing together things that you wouldn't necessarily um, think might go together so that we really get the most exciting ideas and, and the most innovative thinking going into how we might solve a particular challenge 
And then we we do a bit of due diligence. Well, I say we, obviously I mean, I mean the sector experts who really understand about these technologies, they do the due diligence. And then we present that back to our challenge holders to say like, which of these, which of these solutions takes your interest? Which of these solutions do you think will best meet your needs? And we start to make those connections directly then. So we start to introduce the, the solution providers to the challenge holders. There's much more opportunity then to ask questions, to really explore those solutions. Ultimately, we then want those to lead to some kind of trial perhaps, and then ultimately those solutions being implemented. And that's really, that's really the key, isn't it? We need things to be actually implemented in real life so that we can start to make these these net zero targets into a reality. We've been running this pro this platform for four years, um, running them mainly with big corporates and finding solutions for some of their challenges. And we've then been piloting it over the last year with our, with our local authorities. And so through through that pilot project, we we already saw that we got say 60, around 60 high quality proposals that we were then able to present back to our, our, our group of local authorities. And those are now, some of those solutions are now being trialed. And even though we're not yet at the point where we're at full implementation, we've already seen that we've got over half a million pounds of cost savings that have been achieved just in the process so far. Which is a great start and we're now working with as with Ad, with Adam and the East of England Local Government Association and with with Kevin's team in Innovate UK to look at this from a regional perspective. So what does this look like if we take a whole chunk of the country and really explore it from that point of view? We're seeing a lot of these same challenges in these categories coming through, but we've also had some challenges come through that are really specific to that area. And there are, of course, lots of things around, say, transport and energy systems where taking a whole regional view is really, really important. So we've already got um, 11 challenges identified from our challenge identification work that we did a couple of weeks ago. And we're now in the process of refining those and deciding which ones might be suitable for an IX. We think one of them, we've already got solutions that we can just plug straight in. And so there's, there's probably a, a very short process that needs to happen there. Um, and then some other ones that are maybe need a slightly different approach. I think another big theme that's come out of today's talks is the role of culture and behaviour change in this process. And so that's something I would certainly love to explore a bit more of, of how we support this whole behaviour change and this whole culture change as we move towards net zero, because it's not just about the technologies. So I'm going to end with my call to action because we're really quite still early on in our in our process here. We've had some we've had some good success so far, but really we want we want to take this further. So if you're sitting here from uh, a local authority and you think, oh, wait a minute, I'm not involved in this community. How, how can I get a piece of this action? It is absolutely not too late. We'd love to have you join. Doesn't matter where you are in your journey with this. If you're right at the start and you're just figuring out what the hell am I gonna do to achieve these targets? And I've got all of these other things on my day job and I just don't have any brain capacity left to deal with net zero on top of all of that. Fantastic, come along, <laughs> we'll help you out. We've got lots of people who can who can help you untangle some of the technological um, language and and maybe piece piece you in with some of the other authorities that are that are further on or have got more resource. Equally, if you're further on in your journey, and you've got some success or some lessons learned to share, like oh we tried that it did not work, that's equally really valuable for for the community to know. So please join us. If you've got a solution that you think would be really helpful for your local authority to adopt and it would help with this um, route to net zero, then you sign up to our innovation exchange platform. All of the challenges will be launched through that, so you'll be kept up to date and you'll, you might get signposted to some other ones from some of the corporates that we work with as well. Um, and if you're some other part of the puzzle here, then we also want to understand how we can work with you. We're not here to duplicate any activity that's going on. So if there's local initiatives or, or other 
bits and pieces, other tools, other offers that we can we can add in and signpost people to, then delighted to explore those with you as well. Um, obviously, we're going to have the panel now, but I'm also around for a bit afterwards if anybody wants to, to talk about it in any more detail. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everybody. I'm bringing up the rear. Um, thank you, Kevin, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I think it's good. It works. I think it's good for you that I'm here in person as well, because I wouldn't like to inflict me my face 10 feet high on the screen. It wouldn't, it, it, it wouldn't be pleasant. Um, so my name is Matthew Davidson, and um, as, as Naomi said at the beginning, um, Natalie's here with me. Um, Natalie's only just started. It's a pleasure to have um, Natalie and, and her experience um, as the sort of industry outward-facing side of, of, of ICAST. But as she's only just started, it wasn't um, fair to, to, to get her to stand up and do all of this. But she's here for the networking afterwards, and, um, and, and will contribute to the questions as well, I'm sure, and the answers to the questions. So um, I'm going to say a little bit about what we're doing um, in terms of trying to bridge this gap um, in partnership with, with industry and with local authorities and, and, and with places. But by way of um, context, just to, to kick things off, um, th these are some of the things that um, the University of Bath is doing and you know some, some of the really up-to-date things. Um, there's the Institute for Advanced Automotive Propulsion Systems in terms of innovation. Um, that, that's at the Bristol and Bath Science Park and, and will be opening shortly. Um, Camera is a motion capture innovation studio um, which is a really interesting initiative um, based in Bristol, in fact. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Innovation Centre for Applied Sustainable Technologies. But I think maybe the message from this slide is the role, is just an indication of, of, of the economic role that I think universities can play in helping to bridge this gap and, and, and working together with other partners. I mean, if you look down at the bottom, I think there's a, there's a pointer here. Um, you know, this is, this is the, the, the GVA that's um, estimated to be generated by, by the, the combined GVA of, of, of these activities over whatever time scale it is. Um, so um, universities, I think, are significant players in, in, in this innovation space and increasingly so. Um, Again, in terms of context, um, just by way of background, um, as Naomi mentioned at the beginning, I'm the director of a, of a research centre at the University of Bath. Um, this is a, a, a centre for sustainable and circular technologies. Of course, net zero is, is, is a key part of our remit. Um, we work across all sorts of different sectors, um, a lot in the chemical space. Um, and I don't really want to go into this much further at, at this point, except to say that um, it's a research centre that's interdisciplinary within the university. It works closely with industry, but it's concerned with fundamental research. Um, and the story of how we've got more involved in innovation is, is, is really what we'll come to at the moment. I don't really um, need to blow our trumpet too much. It, 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 it's a significant activity at the universities, um, but it's an activity in fundamental research. But over the years, and particularly I would say over the last five years, we've become increasingly interested in how we can translate that fundamental research to commercial application. In many of the applied areas that um, my colleagues in, in, in Bath and their industry collaborators and their, their national and international collaborators indeed are working in, um, the, there ain't really much point in doing it unless we're actually applying it and, and applying it commercially and, and, and seeing the, the benefits of it to society. Um, so we started a few years ago with ERDF funding in the west of England region. Um, we, we started a business acceleration hub um, in collaboration with Set Squared, which um, for those of you who aren't aware of what Set Squared is, it's a fantastic organization. It's, it, it, it's an incubation organization um, jointly owned by um, six southern and, and, and in, indeed Welsh universities now. Um, and we started the Sustainable Technologies Business Acceleration Hub. And it really surprised us how many industries and how many companies came out of the woodwork um, and wanted that um, research-focused business innovation support. And this is the key. We were working really closely with Set Square to provide um, research expertise as a gateway to the university to, to help those companies. Um, 
Stabber, as we called it, uh, finished in 2021. I think we, um, we interacted with over 150 companies and generated, I think, 14, 15 million pounds in grant income and a similar amount in investment in those companies over that time. And the West of England Sustainable Technology Scale-Up Programme is, is the follow-up to that that is ongoing at the moment. So please, you know, if you're, if you're local and you're interested, please do um, contact us about that. Um, but I want to just say a few words about um, this exciting new initiative that, um, that, that, that we're undertaking at the moment, which is um, you know, a little bit more concrete in terms of how we can do the translation, which is the Innovation Centre for Applied Sustainable Technologies. And this is a partnership. Um, and I was struck by um, what Kevin and, and others indeed said about how local authorities need to be working together and not working in competition with each other. Um, and the Innovation Centre for Applied Sustainable Technologies is a partnership. It's a partnership between two universities, the University of Bath and the University of Oxford. Um, it involves the High Value Manufacturing Catapult, the National Composite Centre here in Bristol, um, and, and CPI, the Centre for Process Innovation, uh, which has sites around the country, but predominantly in the northeast. Um, and it's a partnership with Set Squared as well. But what you can see is some of these areas here. This is the Set Squared partnership area. Um, these are the, the local authorities here, and this is the Western Gateway. And I think the key to achieving critical mass with these things, and, and, and ICAST has got a lot of resource, but you know, it needs to sustain and develop further. Then we need to work together, and we need to work with catapults, with industry, and with local authorities, and not just one local authority, or not just one area, because there ain't going to be lots of these things around the country. You know, this is a, a, would be a significant investment in two or three years' time. Um, so it does have to be a partnership. But nevertheless, this started last year and it's got £70 million of funding, £5 million of it from Research England. Um, and its real aim is, is to translate discoveries in green and sustainable technologies through to commercial application. Um, there are really three um, instruments by which we can do this. We, we, we have expertise and again, one of the things, this comes to what people were saying earlier as well. Um, universities and indeed catapults, and I, I, and I sort of would, um, don't have huge experience, but local authorities I would suspect fit in this category. They're Byzantine organizations. It's difficult to get hold of all the people in them. Um, so one of Natalie's jobs is, is, is to be that gateway and know the people in the organization and be able to find the right people. Um, but we're also employing what we're calling technology translators who are postdoctoral researchers who can work in an agile way with industrial partners. Um, and again, I think Adam said this, you know, local authorities can work very slowly, so can universities and so can Innovate UK, I hasten to add, you know. Um, we, we all work pretty slowly compared to commercial timescales sometimes. Um, but if we've got everything in place and, and, and we can respond quickly with, with, with a pool of, of, of expertise, then, then that's what we should do and that's what ICAST is trying to do. Um, the facilities at the universities involved and our partners um, and the high value manufacturing catapult are really world class and, and it's a gateway to the facilities that we have as well. It's not easy to find expertise and facilities within organizations. Um, and then there are, there are a number of mechanisms and I'm going to go through the mechanisms pretty quickly because I don't really have much time. Um, of course, we're interested in the fundamental research and, and how that translates through. So I, I, this is just a flavor of the areas we're interested in. Um, so, you know, it really is, um, it, it really is, in terms of net zero, the, 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 the chemicals and chemistry are very important. So it's about feedstocks, it's about replacing fossil feedstocks. It's about engineering materials for construction, for aerospace, for renewable energy. It's about circular plastics for packaging, so single-use plastics and in healthcare and in packaging and, and things like that. And then um, we have a lot of expertise in sustainable manufacturing, and that encompasses areas like digitization, miniaturization, distribu distributed manufacturing, digital twins, but also biotechnology. Um, so there's a vast area that we can bring to a, a huge cross-section of, of, of sectors. It, 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 it goes across many, many industrial sectors and many sectors that, the, um, that, um, um, that, that, that local authorities are interested in as well. I'm not going to go through these in any detail, um, these projects. I, I want to get through the joint industry projects. These are the agile things that we can do, um, working, working with industry and working with um, catapults and working with all sorts of other people. Um, but I do want to say a little bit about the Creative Hub, which is sort of where I'll finish off. 
Um, so we're working closely in this instance with um, Swindon Borough Council and, and, and Swindon and Wiltshire LEP. Um, this is strategically between Bath and Oxford. It's, it, it, it's a very strategic location for us. And within the carriage works at Swindon, we're developing this creative hub. Um, it's a fantastic, iconic building, and this will be ready next year. Um, but this is where we want to bring people together. And I think this is another key point that's come out in some of the other talks that, and, and points that people have made. Um, I believe to make progress in this, this is, this is actually fundamentally about co-location. It's about learning each other's languages, speaking the same languages. It's also about having those um, serendipitous meetings between people. And when we're in silos, in, 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 whether, whether it's in, 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 in local government, whether it's in industry, whether it's in academia, um, we're not co-located, we're not working together. So I think that's the ambition for ICAST is um, the creative hub at the Carriage Works will be the start of this, but we need that sort of bricks and mortar facility where we can co-locate people. And the final thing about that is it, 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 it speaks to language and it speaks to skills. Nobody's actually, I think, directly mentioned skills yet, um, but I think quite a lot of what we need to do, quite a lot of the barriers that, that people have talked about are actually about training and skills and not just training undergraduates and postgraduates and postdocs, and, um, but, but training whole workforces um, to understand the language, um, to understand some idea of sustainability assessment, for instance, life cycle assessment, what does it mean? People need to be speaking those languages, so we need in collaboration to train people um, uh, who are the future leaders and the future decision makers uh, in local government, in national government, in industry and in universities. So I think that's all I want to say. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to um, um, the discussion that we're going to have now. Uh, we do have a new website. Natalie's here, I'm here. We'll be here for a little while afterwards if you want to talk further. Thank you very much. Hi, um, so I'll just let the panel settle into their seats and um, I think we're expecting to get Amnita back up on the screen as well. I'm sure somebody will press a couple of buttons and that will happen imminently. But whilst that happens, let me just introduce myself. Um, so I'm Steve Hilton. Um, for a number of years I worked within local government. Um, I ended up running a department in Bristol called Futures. And within that department was responsible for the City Council's work on climate change and adaptation. Also set up a city innovation team. Um, for the last six years I've been running my own business, City Global Futures, working with councils both in the west of England but also more broadly around this issue of innovation and smart and sustainable futures. So I've spent a good proportion of my working career in the chasm of innovation, as um, Amnita called it, between the public and private sector, desperately looking for ladders and bridges. So I'm delighted to be able to sort of chair this discussion. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions in a second, so please, um, please start to think about those. I just wanted to kick off with a question first for each of the panel members, just to really quickly respond to. I've heard a lot about the public sector and the private sector. I've heard less about citizens and communities. And I, I just wondered what your thoughts are on, on how, how, you know, how, how can we create a culture that also means that citizens and communities welcome innovation? and change. What can councils do in that respect? Are there any, any ideas or suggestions that you have about how we take people with us on this journey? Shall Anybody I, want to leap in? Shall, shall, I, Kevin. shall I jump in on that one? Um, I think that's, that, that's a really vital part because oh. th this, isn't, this isn't actually about technology. None of this is. It's about making people's lives better, and more sustainable. Um, but the thing about these these tools that we uh, we are looking to introduce uh, in order to achieve this the net zero ambitions is that if if people don't find them acceptable if they don't find them um, useful then they're not going to be utilised they're going to be resisted and we're not going to get that um, 
that impact that's that's required. So, so you're absolutely right that bringing people with us on this journey is is vitally important. So, including them in the uh, design, development, testing of all of these systems, making sure that they are usable and, as I say, acceptable uh, and accessible, uh, is is absolutely vital. Uh, how we do that probably depends on the, the, the context of use and the different technology that might be deployed. But uh, certainly, we have to we have to begin at the outset to think about how people are going to use these things and, and involve them in their design. Thank you, Kevin. If, if, does anybody else want to respond to that, or should we open it up to questions? Um, yeah, I say yeah. I can say that certainly in, in our work in smart places and smart cities, and um, further work in sort of more rural areas as well, um, we're seeing that the trend for making sure that developments are challenge-based and co-created mm. is um, just getting further and further embedded. I don't think that trend is going to stop. I don't think councils would be interested in doing something innovative and technology-led now that is technology-led. Instead, they're looking for challenge-based challenge solutions, so technologies that they can apply directly to those challenges. And in defining those challenges, they will engage with communities that have them. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think that trend's going to stop. Great. So defining the challenge to be addressed in yeah. a way that makes sense to people and communities that live and work within a city is part of... Uh, well, we talked yeah. about changing the language, didn't we? But it's part of that journey, isn't it? Yeah, so instead of looking at an innovative technology and thinking like, oh, where can we use this? Mm. It's looking at the challenge at hand and then looking at, OK, what technology can be applied to that? Yeah, very good. Good. OK, so my eyesight is incredibly bad and I can't really see anybody much. So um, I'm going to ask the people with microphones to find a couple of people with questions. If you can say who you are, if your question's aimed at a particular member of the panel, please say so, but if it isn't, then we'll, we'll just sort of open it up. Well, let's take a couple of questions and see, see what sort of issues we have. Um, yeah, hello. Um, just at the back here. I'll stick my hand up. Um, my name's uh, Simon Pine. I run a consultancy called Greener Energy Futures. Uh, we're very much involved in developing net zero plans for organisations. Um, Avon Fire and Rescue, St Monica's Trust locally. Now, uh, it seems to me, and I think it, you've all touched on the kind of the landscape of net zero. Uh, one of the constant things that I'm looking for is rapid, scalable opportunities of ch for change, because make no mistake, we need to move quickly mm. and in an agile fashion. I'm really interested to know if you, any of you, see tipping points where we should be pressurizing and putting a real focus on transforming something that, that you can see is just over the horizon that will scale a rapid uh, pace of change and a rapid adaptation towards a you know, net zero goal. Thank you for that question, Simon. Let's, let's just hold that for one second. Let's take one more and then we can, um, we can sort of... Uh, Does, it, broken Does it work? Down. Yeah, OK. Hi, I'm Ted Fowler. I live here. I'm involved in various projects and work for the economic development in the City Council and started up a number of institutions, including an investment company. Uh, for public good. So I'm, re I'm very interested in the heart of this. Certainly, when I worked at Bristol City Council, we developed a methodology called market development for procurement, which basically meant that we threw out a challenge that came through political or social or community requirements um, to a, a range of suppliers, potential suppliers and other stakeholders for a series of workshops and came back with that um, to, to define the the procurement, I think that might be what you're talking about, that kind of approach where you engage with people. I'm, I see quite often that innovation as it's developed through the public sector is now more and more short term because of the political um, parameters of mayoral and other concerns. So I'm, I'm really interested in how we how people in the panel see that we might be able to frame challenges that aren't just a response to suppliers' requirements, but are responses to citizens' requirements. And, and have you got examples from other places on how citizens and other stakeholders can be involved in creating and framing these challenges for the long term? Thank you, Ted. Um, so we've got two questions. One about what, what will the catalysts and the tipping points and the milestones be that accelerate the, the, the sort of progress towards um, adopting and applying innovative solutions. 
And then um, from Ted, this sort of goes back to this idea of co-producing challenges and how we how we actually do that. If anybody's got any practical examples to share, so um, Matthew, would you like to answer either of those? Yeah, I, I mean. The tipping points is a really interesting one because you know there's a history of these things being tipping points. I see a tipping point um, coming up soon as being um, using fossil-based resources for materials. Um, you know we, we, we're largely replacing energy now with renewable energy. Um, solar and wind are, are, are so cheap now; nobody would invest in a um, except, except for base load. Nobody would invest in in, in oil or gas or coal fire power stations on economic grounds. Um, th there's a real tipping point, whether it's in personal care, whether it's in packaging, whether it's in construction, whether it's in automotive, of um, the supply chains that we see um, really, really wanting bio-based resources rather than fossil-based resources for materials. Just come in, thank you. See, we've got um, Amnita back up on the screen. Can I check, Amnita? Can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I can hear you guys uh, loud right. and clear. <laughs> and did, did Sorry. You, that's okay. Did you hear the questions, um, Amnita? Or, because or, I was, I was wondering whether you would have a view on what the, what the tipping points might be that will um, encourage more housing providers to adopt the sorts of solutions that you would you were talking about in your presentation how bad is it going to have to get before things start to open up to new ways of working right well um i think we've actually passed the tipping point because of covid um so i think covid has kind of really opened up um everyone's I mean, it's basically just widen everyone's perception in terms of using technology to help us. Uh, because of COVID, schools and houses now want um, CO2 sensors, right? Uh, so that they can track and monitor the indoor air pollution. Uh, and from that, people are realizing that there are a lot of other reasons to have this technology. And it's kind of aligned with our net zero goals um, using this technology. So a lot of the time we have um, we have social landlords who will say things like, oh, we're, we need it because, you know, this legislation is in place now for indoor air quality, for example. And um, if we're gonna use it for that, we realize that we can also use it for our net zero goals. So I think we've already hit that tipping point. Um, and right now it's more about um, just running with it, yeah. Well, that's really good to hear. And I really like that point you make that um, taking one step and doing one thing differently then perhaps creates an opportunity to build upon that and to see what other benefits can also be delivered alongside the, the, the first step that's taken. Add a about a forum in the east of England and I think you talked about officers and and politicians coming together I think you, yep. you said yeah, that is, right. is there something you could share with us about how the political dynamic works is it is it giving greater confidence to those political leaders to embrace innovative ideas yeah I think I think there's a certain amount of that involved I think in terms of engaging more in the challenges that citizens see rather than decision makers. It's all about changing the relationship between um, members of the public and those decision makers. I think in the past there might have been a view that these people have been voted for and therefore represent you know, everyone within their area and therefore they're well placed to kind of make big decisions about those areas. But that's not so true anymore. I think local politicians are much more up for having a conversation with members of the public to find out what their pressures are and what they see as the challenges and therefore what sorts of things should we be asking the market to provide. Um, one example of that is that uh, one of our county councils, Essex County Council, has uh, just embarked upon a, a big kind of new programme called Everyone's Essex, um, which is trying to completely shift that dynamic and really get members of the public involved in what the county council does. Um, I think that can be difficult at times because it can be difficult to kind of ask these really broad, big questions to members of the public and just hope that they'll kind of be interested enough to come and talk to us about it. 
I think when you've got kind of a really specific thing to talk about, it's easier. I know speaking from personal um, experience when I was a commissioner in adult social care, I was responsible for commissioning um, support for, for people that are homeless or at risk of homelessness. And I um, introduced a programme of co-production with people that were experiencing those services and really talking to them about what kind of support would you value most. Um, and that was really powerful because we found out the huge amount we were doing, all this kind of bureaucratic paperwork in the background, which the commissioners felt was really important at the time, wasn't important at all and wasn't achieving anything. So shifting that, getting rid of the paperwork and really using the funding and the time of officers to focus on the support that those people would really value and actually make a difference um, was in incredibly powerful. Um, and therefore we, we had something kind of really specific and tangible to talk about and do. Um, and I think achieving net zero and, and kind of um, hitting our climate change targets probably is uh, something that everybody can get behind, I think, in the main, and therefore have a, a kind of really open conversation about what the specific challenges are from communities and th therefore what we need to look to the market to help us, um, to help us solve. Thank you, Adam. And uh, Kazi, can you build upon that in terms of the, I liked the word that you used a lot, which was exchange, this idea that it is a, you know, it's, it's not one side or the other, it's not us and them, it is an exchange of, of ideas and experience. It, 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 through the network that you're pulling together, is, is there a lot of talk about how to frame the challenges in a way that makes them sort of better? Yeah, and I would say that's, um, when I first started at KTN, my original job title was Technology Translator, mm. which is a terrible job title, <laughs> but... It's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Arguably, not maybe the most clear job title, but I think it does speak to a lot of the role of the organisation around... It is like a translation role that everyone speaks a different language, and I've worked in quite a lot of different sectors, and every time you have to learn, oh, what are the acronyms that you're using and what are these jargon terms and what does it mean to you and how are you thinking about it? And a lot of the time, you know, it's the same things, but people have different language to use it. And having, so one, bringing people together is really important because you need to start a conversation. People need to be in the same room or virtually in the same room to be able to even begin this process. But then beyond that, they might be in the same room, but if they're speaking different languages that they don't understand, you're still not really going to, you know, make much progress. So a lot of the time we, we kind of act as a sort of facilitator between these different languages to say, mm. well, when you're saying that, is that, do you mean mm. this, that this person is experiencing? And, and, and trying to make these steps to, the, I get it is that bridging the gap between mm this conversation that you're having over here about this challenge that you're experiencing and this conversation you're having over here about this widget that you've made and what, does the widget do the thing that they need it to do? Like, can we, yeah. can we figure that bit out? And if we can get to that, then you start to see real progress happening, but it's not passive. So part of it is bringing people together. And then there's another really active step, which is how do we find common language? And but you have to involve people. I think it goes back to the, the, that first question about citizen engagement. I mean, any time you're trying to change something or bring in something new, I mean, humans, we have a, it's like an innate a, a phobia of it. You know, it's, oh, something new, it's different. Oh, I don't like it, make it stop. <laughs> so how we get up, how we get past that, you know, when we see, okay, well, we need to meet Z net zero. We need to stop the, the planet warming. We understand that, but still, but, oh, but what does this mean? Like, what does it mean for me every day? Does it mean I still get cornflakes for breakfast? You know, people, so, you know, it gets really kind of in, intrus intrusive into people's sort of personal safety very quickly. So I think if we can have those conversations and just keep it very open at every step of the, along the way with all of these different parts of the... Yes. I recognise, uh, thank you for that, I recognise a lot of that from my own experience um, and this, it always used to have this sense that actually brave leadership is, is often about saying I don't know, which is, is a bit incongruous because people want you to know the answer to mm. big challenges but sometimes 
the best thing to do is to say, I don't really know, what do you think? And through that conversation, um, it's sort of, sort of getting to a point of shared understanding. But we often work in a culture where it's difficult to say you don't know the answer or even to say, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Can you explain that to me? So there's something yeah, have, around building trust. I have and definitely found not that saying I don't know has almost been one of the most powerful tool, yeah. tools in my job. I made that I went from working in one it? sector, <laughs> working in one sector where I did sort of know, and then I went into a role where I was working with lots of different organisations, lots of different companies across all sectors trying to help them get investment and they would tell them, oh we're doing this thing and it can do that and you're like, I don't understand any of the words that you just said. Very good. But actually asking that question, I started off and I was like, oh gosh I'm terrible at my job, I obviously don't know because I don't understand this, but actually asking the question was, as you said, so powerful because then people start to, oh, oh right, okay, well actually it's this. Oh, right, great. Well, let's say that then, because yeah. that's the language that we all get. Very good. So, I don't know, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to come back to the audience for some questions. I'd really like to hear some questions from um, women in the audience as well. So, I'll do that in a second, but I just wanted one question. <laughs> oh, all the men are going, oh, sorry. <laughs> one question from, for Emma. Emma, when I read your report, which is very good, um, the, what shocked me, amongst many things, was how few procurements were identified as having any connection with net zero. Amongst all of yeah. the money that is spent collectively through uh, local government, there was a, a minute proportion, really, that, that was attributable to, to net zero, and the bulk yeah. of that was consultancy. But yeah. how, how do you, how, how, so there's something in there about the language not being right or, or the connections not being made. How does that relate to this framing of the challenges, do you think? Seems like a really fundamental mismatch. Um, it does. I do think it's getting better. Um, I don't know how many people here do supply local authorities, but we're seeing more and more that they use the social value framework as part of the mm. yeah as part of their assessment criteria, which does involve a lot of sustainability outcomes for um, the environment and those living and working within it. So um, we're seeing that more and more. Makes me wonder how that started. <laughs> you know, um, how has that gotten through into procurement specifications? But there are lots of different ways to procure and there are lots of different ways to successfully procure net zero innovative solutions um, and they are often isolated in certain authorities or certain combined authorities or groups mm. and um, different councils have different ways of doing things. Neighbouring councils have different ways of doing things. I've worked with councils that have the same terribly formatted word document for every single procurement mm. activity and it, it's infuriating whereas the council that's literally across a river from them has a highly skilled highly dedicated procurement team who spend time with the officers requiring the procurement in order to understand which mechanism is best for them to use mm. so it's just about different approaches and in some cases about making sure they resource the correct approach the procurement officers in local authorities are the same one buying same ones who are buying the staples mm. as well as the ones buying the smart parking sensors the iot devices the mm. things that are going to support net zero, so how are they supposed to translate their processes to both of those solutions if they haven't got the capacity to think about new ideas. And something I've been working on in Leeds, um, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority have got a remit to um, introduce more innovative net zero and crucially co-created solutions with the local community. Um, but they have actually turned to us and said, we don't know how to do this. How can we set up a procurement activity that will assess um, activities on these levels so it is tricky but I think it is getting better as this you know like I said the social value framework has come in mm. um, and good yeah <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry I didn't need to cut you short I'm, so, I'm, uh, I'd like to just take some more questions but it's good to hear that um, that social value um, framework as part of procurement it's, yeah. it's got some teeth and that people that people I start think so, to yeah. sort of use it. People okay. know what it is, yeah. So let's go back to the audience. Um, if there are any women who have a question, please do stick your hand up. If you're a man, you can still ask a question, but I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to hear a bit of balance from the audience. So please find me some questions. So, uh, hi everyone, my name's uh, Callum Jack and I'm a Smart Cities Consultant at Jacobs Engineering. 
Um, something that's been mentioned a lot was uh, funding and access to funding for local authorities. Um, I think the UK Cities Climate Investment Commission recently published a report identifying that there's a 200 billion pound gap in funding um, to, for local authorities to meet their uh, net zero infrastructure targets by 2050. Um, do, do we think local authorities sort of have the skills and capacity to access uh, private green finance? Mm. And what barriers do we think um, they'll need to overcome in order to access this? That's a good question, Callum. Thank you. Let, hang on to that for a second. Is, are there any other questions we can take as well? Yeah. Um, Matt uh, from the much aforementioned City Innovation team at the City Council. Um, so potentially a controversial question given that context. Um, is innovation potentially a barrier rather than an enabler of net zero? Oh. <laughs> say, say a little bit more <laughs> about what you mean by that, Matt. I was going to offer to say what I mean by that, <laughs> if, if that's helpful. So um, in a nutshell, do we have the solutions? We just need to get on and implement them. Mm, OK. And is there a third question we can take? Let's do that then. Uh, hello, Colin Taylor. I'm Emeritus Professor at the University of Bristol in, in Civil Engineering, um, but I'm also leading the Southwest Infrastructure Partnerships um, work on, on Net Zero. SWIP is a neutral forum of infrastructure stakeholders from across the Southwest, uh, and it enables them to get together and, and join up their, their thinking, which uh, hopefully will influence practice. I think from our work, one of the, the questions I really want to ask uh, uh, today is, Net zero is an outcome of how we live and behave. It's not a bolt on to to the way that we behave. Therefore, it's a consequence of our strategic economic architecture, and that needs to be decarbonised. Uh, also, net zero is forever. It's not just for 2050. So, to deliver it, it needs continuity of vision, uh, mission, and joined up thinking and practice. Now, whilst churn of local authority members and officers is good in terms of injecting new ideas, how do we ensure that it also maintains that long-term continuity? Very good. That's difficult, I think. Thank you for that. Um, so, we've got three questions. We've got, we've got from uh, Callum a question around access to funding and finance. From Matt, We've got a challenge that maybe we're all a bit too distracted with shiny new innovation yeah. and we ought to use things that are already de-risked and then from colin uh, this thing around you know this is forever now it's not you know it's easy to think of election cycles it's easy to think of government funding programs but we're really talking about a wholesale investment in infrastructure for the future so who kevin you it looks like you want to yeah. say something I, I'm, I'm happy to address matt's challenge um <laughs> Um, I think I'll start by saying that innovation isn't just about technology or tools. Innovation is about the way that, that we think and act, uh, the way that we set up our businesses, the way that we structure our uh, organisations. So there's lots of changes that can be made which will be impactful and effective without even thinking about uh, widgets and shiny stuff. And uh, But also... Uh, Net, net zero by 2050 is our generation's moonshot. This is, you know, th this is as complex, as difficult, as involved, and potentially as expensive as putting a man on the moon. And so we do need also these step-changing technologies to be involved in it. It's not about um, uh, being more efficient or effective with the things we've already got at play. Um, so I think the combination of different ways of thinking, different ways of structuring uh, stuff, um, different attitudes to perhaps how we collaborate, all of that's part of innovation, but also somewhere in that mix there needs to be technology that's really going to lift us off towards that, uh, that very, very challenging target. Can I just Sorry, say, go on, Matthew. Yeah. Can I just say something very quick about that question? We need we need all of those things. Um, just to address you know the point you made, mm. I absolutely agree. We need to be taking ten gigatons a year out of the atmosphere in twenty fifty in order to maintain any form of balance. So we need you know we need all, all the simple solutions, but we need new technologies. It, it it it's not conceivable that we don't need to implement new technologies in the next fifty years. Completely inconceivable. 
they have no choice. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Adam, um, this, question, <laughs> this, this question of finance mm -hmm. is an interesting one. So, you know, local government is often focused uh, quite rightly on reducing costs and saving money and, and you know, cu cutting cost out of things to make it as efficient as possible. It's perhaps less focused on piecing together, you know, Ten billion pound infrastructure deals to to, to sort of um, decarbonise energy or transport systems. Is is this a sort of skill set or an opportunity that local government needs to develop? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's all around skill set. I think it's just a lack of kind of awareness and understanding of the different routes to finance for for local authorities and groups of local authorities for um, all sorts of things like large infrastructure projects. Um, the region I represent, the east of England, has kind of historically seen a lack of central government investment for uh, key infrastructure projects therefore we, we do need to start looking at other options and funny enough just in the last couple of weeks we've started having those conversations about what other options are there out there you know what kind of private sector financing options are there um, and a, a group my organization and a group of other bodies so we have called subnational transport bodies which are kind of big strategic uh, bodies looking at transport issues across our region um, uh, looking into some work to, to firstly understand what what options are out there to then um, start thinking about what we need to target so yeah it's it's about skill set it's about awareness and understanding and i think the area i represent is on the journey towards understanding that but um Definitely not there yet. It's something that we need to work on. Thank you. And Kasia, is that part again of the sort of KTN ambition around sort of creating bigger ambition that's shared across a number of different places? Yeah. Um, uh, it's sort of sometimes counterintuitive, but sometimes asking for a bigger chunk of money can be oddly easier than yeah. small amounts of money. Yeah. But we were having this conversation just yesterday, yeah. weren't we, Kevin, about, well, if there are some big, say, infrastructure projects, for example, around you know, an en energy system, say, and it, we're looking at a whole region like the east of England, well, actually, if the whole region works together and we almost do like one big procurement or one, you know, combine it all together into something bigger, it might actually be more possible to leverage in the investment for that than by them doing it piecemeal. It doesn't always sort of follow that, that sort of natural logic of, well, we've just asked for a little bit of money over here, but almost sort of saying, like, it's this big thing that we need to do and it's going to deliver these benefits to this whole region. It's still, it's actually, it's more, much more cost effective than doing it piecemeal. Mm. I think there are, um, there are a couple of other uh, mechanisms underneath that as well. Mm. One, one of them is, it's much easier to manage because mm. you've got one, you've got yeah. one supplier there to kick um, and it's it's also about um, it, well it's about government budgets and it's much easier to manage the flow of one single budget and map and plan that rather than you know 10, 15, 100 smaller projects which are all working in unison and government is all about balancing the books and making sure that you can predictably mm. see where the money's flowing. Mm. And having a big flagship, something or other, that you can go, uh, Yeah, absolutely. Ta -da! Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I think that's, that's true. I think, I think at the heart of um, the question is also the fact that it's not just about public funding. It's mm. about commercially available finance that pays back over longer periods of mm. time, perhaps, than most authorities or even governments are used to and, and there's a degree of risk around that and you know culturally it's difficult I guess politically it's difficult but it feels if we're going to respond to Colin's challenge it's, a, it's about investing really big sums of money isn't it? Uh, this is why I feel though that it comes back to the procurement again and again and again because for business as well if they have got contracts with local authorities that is going to be a massive lever that they can then use to get their own mm. private investment. Mm. Um, so both sides of it, you know, from okay. whether it's local authorities themselves trying to find investment 
the companies that they're procuring from probably also trying to grow and scale yeah, and get their point. own investment and having having a public sector customer is going to be really powerful for yeah. them in that. Yeah, that's a good point. So it helps to de-risk it for the private sector if they've got that commitment and there's something like sharing the risk. There, sharing the risk and that was interesting what you were saying as well about, um, about the, the different business models and actually you know, because I was immediately thinking, oh, there's so many innovative business models that could be utilised, but actually if the procurement isn't set up to allow for those business yeah. models where you might share the risk more with the companies or share the spread the cost maybe over a different time period or... Yeah. I don't know, like, it just seems like it keeps coming to me coming back to this question of how do we innovate around procurement. What's council spend versus N NHS spend in terms of numbers? What, in terms of overall budget? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody Google it? Um, <laughs> I don't know, is it similar? I don't, I'm not, I don't know. The, 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 the NHS, I, I, actually, I don't know. The NHS is far more centralised and, and they, you know, they have a, 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 road, a road map to net zero and, okay. and that is starting to affect their procurement. But of course they can do it in a more joined up way mm. than... Yeah, that's possible. interesting, isn't it? Uh, but it's a similar... Okay. Let, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. That's all right. So, Anita, I wanted to bring you in, uh, and by all means, respond with what you want to say. But let me also just ask you a question. You talked a lot about retrofitting housing. I was really interested in where, what you saw, uh, the opportunities around fu future sort of blueprints for more sustainable housing models. And do you see yourself as being part of that, as, as, as opposed to just retrofitting the ageing housing stock? Right. Um, well, yes, definitely. So it's not just about, so right now we're kind of playing this role in terms of net zero, we're playing this role to, uh, we're playing this supportive role to help housing, um, you know, work towards those goals. But in terms of the future, we want to play a bigger role, obviously. We don't just want, it's like, um, I'm sorry, I forgot which one uh, said this, but I think it was question three about how uh, it, it's not just until 2050, it's about beyond that, right? And the technology that we provide, it's it's not just to reach a goal, it's to maintain things after reaching a goal. So yes, definitely. Um, in terms of uh, access to funding and finance, I actually have um, two really interesting, two really funny, relatable stories on that. Um, so just yesterday, we found another fund um, that helps with retrofitting and what they do is they retrofit homes using money that would normally be spent on the energy bills and maintenance um, in the future. So they take that amount that they've calculated and they use that to retrofit the homes. And, and I listed out a whole bunch of funds and strategies to you guys earlier and we only just found out about this one yesterday. And uh, we were just thinking, like, if we just we're we're in this market, we're in this industry, and we just found out about it yesterday after being in this industry for a couple of years, um, how how are housing associations, how are local authorities going to find them? And I think one really big part, like Adam said, is awareness. Um, it's it's key, and um, like you guys mentioned earlier, it's about this teamwork between the both of us, kind of coming together and sharing this knowledge with each other. Um, starting from the very beginning from procurement. Uh, so we were thinking about how, you know, we've got to approach them and we've got to tell them, uh, this is our solution. This is where we fit in, in your goals. Uh, when you reach out to local authorities, you know, let them know that these are some of the options that we're out there. And I think it's part of our responsibility to to play that um, to play, play that role of bringing awareness to the different local authorities out there. Because um, it in part yes it's true there may not be enough funding but in part i also think that there's a lot out there that we haven't found um and on another uh, on, a, on a different aspect we've had uh, local authorities for example uh, a school came to us and they said we're going to put in an application for a bid for i think 300 to 600 thousand uh, pounds for um to to check on uh, the indoor air pollution in, in schools and to put in this application, you know, they didn't need it to fill out a whole bunch of different forms and they had a whole bunch of different questions and they were asking us, we don't know what to put in. We know we need it, 
but we don't know what to put in. We don't have the information or the words. And we were just like, yeah, you know, we're going to help you. We're going to get you there. We're going to give you the statistics, the facts and everything. So it's a lot to do with collaboration and working together uh, in terms of, of both going past 2050, thinking about the future and in terms of finding the right find, um, fundings and to finance the, the whole thing. Yeah. You. So we, we all need to be looking for the money together. <laughs> so I, I'm going to come back to the audience for one last round of questions in a second. Um, uh, and if I may, I'm going to take a few minutes just before we finish to try and, to try and sum up some of the things that I've heard. It, it, one of the things that really occurred to me as Anita was talking is that there is quite a lot of um, experience and practice within local authorities around this. Um, when I was at Bristol, we worked on, a, 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 at the time, a European Investment Bank-funded programme called ELENA, which was, um, the reason it worked is it gave you upfront funding to create a team who could, a skilled team who could develop a pipeline of energy retrofit projects. And often the bit that I think is most difficult to fund is the people. There's often money for hard infrastructure but the sort of revenue costs to do the thinking and to develop the projects and to build the relationships that's the bit i think that it's often most difficult to fund clearly bristol putting a word for bristol because i think um, it, it is a council that has many innovative people within it is still very actively working on this city leap program that's looking at creating a, a very big shared investment in sustainable energy for the future. So there's lots to learn from. So we, should, we shouldn't downplay, I think, some of the innovation that already happens. Back to the audience. If there are any, maybe there aren't any women here, I can't see. Yeah, we've but, got um, in the front uh, room. If there are any women with a question, let's hear one. I'm a woman. Thank you. Hey, well done. <laughs> Thank, you for, Thank you for asking a question. So, um, a few years ago, we were put through the very painful exercise of doing science and innovation audits, which identified, and it was painful, <laughs> having done two of them, where we identified strengths and, and some of the opportunities to develop innovative uh, and innovative uh, research and development opportunities that really could identify key sectors uh, based on regions and places and, and where we can focus opportunities. In this drive towards net zero, and where I can't really see how anything does not fit into that transition in terms, terms of net zero, in terms of technologies, in terms of behavioural changes, in terms of everything fits into net zero and how we're going to achieve it, from my perspective and my view. One of the things I, I've, I've noticed is within the innovation sector, the Access in finance tends to be driven by uh, tends to be driven by competition, competition across different organisations, competition against different sectors, in accessing the national uh, funding opportunities as well as delivering on the uh, agenda that's set at a national level. With now we have some funders and local authorities in the room and, and on the panel, I'd be interested to see how you see your position in convening. Uh, the actors and the players within the groups to bring them towards achieving some of the things and delivering on the strengths of the science and innovation audits to address the net zero challenge. Thank you. Now, just for people who might not be familiar with science and innovation audits, just remind us what they were. Just tell us briefly what they were. <laughs> not everybody will be familiar with that. Uh, so it was an exercise uh, that, uh, please do correct me if I'm wrong, that Innovate UK took uh, alongside government in terms of identifying the key strengths in relation to different regions okay. across the across principally the UK, but also it did go across England specifically as well. And it identified key specialisms and key opportunities based on strengths in terms of research excellence, strengths in terms of innovation capability and innovation opportunities, wherever they were localised in specific points and where they had cross-sectoral opportunities. So, for example, I, I 
participated and led in the science and innovation audit for the London quarter as well as for the Midlands, Midlands engine. So it really focused on where they saw the opportunities were in terms of developing and key actors and where we saw it. But that was an exercise and that was a document that is there in a time and space. How do we capitalize on it? And, yeah. and who are the key actors to bring forward the opportunities from those, those documents, which really gave a good picture of where we saw our strengths? Thank you for taking the time to explain that to us. There are two ways I could frame this, I think, um, or we could frame it. We could say um, regions and, and authorities have done all this work on identifying what their specialisms are and their strengths. So, Kevin, why does Innovate UK only insist that we have to compete for funding? Why don't we just get some? Or yeah. we could say... <laughs> Thanks how, do, how, do we, how do we build upon these strengths that have been identified and what sort of forums or mechanisms do we really need to now prioritise to take yeah. it forward? Well, I, th I think in answer to the first question, um, because of the way that we are obliged to distribute public funds, there needs to be uh, um, a level of open competition so that everybody has equal access. We can't just passport money to... Um, to businesses, and it is businesses that Innovate UK generally will That's fund. Um, with this exercise that we've uh, sort of touched on today, that we call a um, Net Zero Regions Pilot, and it mm. is a pilot, we are looking at some of the um, the options to work in different ways with uh, with regions by clustering the authorities together, uh, encouraging their collaboration. Uh, surfacing their shared challenges, and potentially in the in the future, uh, finding a way to fund collectively uh, businesses and local authorities to solve the most pressing net zero challenges. That money hasn't been confirmed yet, but this is the first step in creating the relationship that hopefully can move toward uh, that sort of more collaborative regional approach. Thank you. I didn't mean to give you too hard a time. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I was always really interested in the way that the Arts Council have moved to doing things, where they create these sort of re this regional sort of structure where they have, I forgot what they call them, but they have, some people remind me, but they have sort of nodes that are then responsible for... Cultural compacts. Well, cultural compacts, but also in terms of funding, they disseminate their th funding through local partners who then, part of their duty is to make sure that the the, the funding is spread through the sort of ecosystem that exists locally. Uh, just Adam, in terms of this, this feels like it, you know, you, Kevin's mentioned the East of England, it fe feel, you talked about devolution. Yeah, I was going to bring in the devolution. You know, yes, thing. Kevin's right, government can't just give money to business for no sort of justification, but, you know, do, do you want government to give you more money in order to be able to develop your sort of shared innovation capability? Yes, please. <laughs> um, in, terms okay. of, <laughs> in terms of devolution, um, as part of the 300 page levelling up white paper that I've been trying to get in my head around the last couple of days, it does um, really flag that, that government have been hearing this message that these kind of competitive short timescale funding bids just don't work locally, don't work for councils, they don't have the resources or capacity to kind of bid for these funding pots and they have committed to kind of looking at a way in which it can be done better in the future and now that might mean kind of allocating it to regions or allocating it to counties. Um, I think whatever structures put in place in the future there's bound to be and will need to be some kind of competitive element in terms of where that funding goes because it's public money we're using and it you know there needs to be some kind of assurance um, around how it's being used but uh, that is to say there's some kind of promising stuff coming out of government around the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which will take over from the kind of the European funding which we've had in the past, um, and a different way to, uh, to allocate that that isn't so competitive, isn't so short timescale, and hopefully helps to achieve this kind of levelling up agenda that's um, big at the minute. Thank you. Kevin, I'm, I'm conscious we've got about five minutes left on the schedule and I, I'm due to hand over to you. Um, would you like me to do that or would you like me to ask <laughs> the panel one closing question? Um, 
Well, I was hoping that you would perhaps sum, sum up, and okay. then then uh, then we'll, we'll be on time then. I think. It's, your, it's your show, so I'm happy to. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> Okay, so here's, in the olden days, I would have done this without notes, but I'm a bit addled now, so I sort of need to just look at my phone to remind myself of what I thought were the key things. From Kevin, I really took this idea that there isn't one gap. We, we've actually got lots of gaps. We've got sort of gaps between urban and rural. We've got gaps between private and public. And we've got a sort of gap of language and knowledge. So whilst we talk about the innovation gap, we're actually talking about quite a lot of different gaps, I think. From Emma, I was really struck with the idea that we need help, all of us, to turn the complexity of net zero into something that is manageable, both conceptually and practically. I know when I think about it, it, it's, it can be overwhelming to even understand where to start. So I think the sort of frameworks and tools that you talked about um, are, are sort of essential just to keep us sane and to keep us in a position where we feel that this is something that can be dealt with in a tangible, practical way. I think from Amnita, I was really interested in not not just the innovation that you described, but also the importance of standards. My experience at local government is that it sort of is split between people who do get excited by big, complicated, exciting challenges, whether that's climate or social justice or, or how, to, how to economically develop an area. There are other people who just say, tell me what it is I'm supposed to do. Give me some standards, give me a framework, give me a toolkit, and then I know what's expected of me. And I think, I think we need both, but particularly from Amnita, that idea of having a code of practice and standards is very strong. From Adam, I wrote a lot of things down, Adam, actually, <laughs> but the, the, the stuff around... Um, sort of motivation and and the idea that you know ca councils uh, whilst they are for, for for social value and good do increasingly have to look widely about where revenues come from you know we can we can we can ask government to to devolve funding you know we, we've been asking that for a long time now and it's not particularly forthcoming um, so there does have to be thinking about where else can revenues and business models come from and how do authorities work in a in a you know more, more commercially minded way but also accept that that might mean different skill sets and different partnerships and then i think from matthew uh, sorry from Ke uh, oh, lost my place now kezia um, you, you very articulately talked about creating a sort of safe space where people from different places, different authorities, different um, sectors can come together and tap into expertise. I think it goes back to that thing of being brave enough to say, look, I really don't know, can you help me? And, and not seeing that as a sign of weakness or you being bad at your job, but actually it's a, it's a, it's a sign that you're good at your job because you're seeking out advice and expertise from others who, who've done this before. And then finally, Matthew, I think, I think that you started out and I think very articulately talked about the fact that this is also about the economic development and prosperity of the area. You, defy, you, know, you talked about the amount of um, grants and revenue that have been brought into to Bath and North East Somerset. But it, that also creates a... a you talked about circular economy and circular um, products in terms of environmental impact. It also creates a sort of circular sense where the place gains a reputation for innovation and sustainability, and therefore it becomes attractive to businesses or researchers or people who want to be part of that ecosystem. So creating it as part of placemaking, yeah. making it part of a sort of city identity, not, not it, brand is too tokenistic, but part of a culture of a place is, is also self-fulfilling around this. So 
I'm at time, and I just want to say thank you to the panel. Let's thank the panel. And, um, thank you to um, the audience. It's great to be here in person with you. Thank you. And I'm just going to do a few thank yous as well, and then we can go and have lunch. Um, thanks, Steve, for chairing so effectively and eloquently, as, as always. Um, thanks to the uh, Festival of Future City team and to the uh, team here at Watershed for putting on such a fabulous event. Thanks again to the panel for giving us such uh, a, a fabulous input today. Thanks to the audience. Brilliant to have an audience, and I'm so grateful that you took the time to come and share this day with us. Um, Let's have lunch. <laughs>